Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and this week is conference week and we have a few seats left if you choose to join us. Amazing speakers including T. Colin Campbell, Neil Barnard, uh, Thomas Seyfried, author of the book Cancer as a Metabolic Disease, Dr. Peter Bregan, the eminent psychiatrist who has never prescribed a drug and has been a great patient advocate, Mariel von Lanthan, the list goes to Dr. Janice Stanger, who's one of our favorite conference speakers. She's here every year. Uh, lots and lots of amazing topics, and it is our 20th anniversary, and I'm very proud of that. We've lasted 20 years in business. We're going to be here for at least 40 more. I'm planning to live 40 more years. Um, that's my plan anyway, so please take care of yourself. I'm going to need to have friends around. That's one of my reasons I do these broadcasts every week. Get a whole bunch of people healthy so I won't be alone. So anyway, plan to be here in Columbus November 4th through 6th this weekend for fabulous food, fabulous fellowship, meet new people, hear inspiring talks, um, eat a piece of cake on us, have a champagne toast, it's going to be great. The other thing I wanted to mention is we are going to have some new uh, certification courses next year in children's health, men's health, cancer, allergies and asthma, gastrointestinal habits, and forming and maintaining new habits, which I'm excited about all of these. And as you, many of you know, who take classes from us regularly, we have wonderful package offers that allow you to take a whole lot of classes at a very expense, inexpensive rate. So you can save a lot of money if you sign up for more than one or two classes at a time. So if you're interested in either conference or learning more about our certification courses, which can help you uh, both in your own journey to better health and also help you to help other people, just send an email to pampopper at msm.com. All right, so a couple topics for today. You've heard the saying, you are what you eat, right? And you are. Well, your gut microbiome is also what you eat. The composition of the gut microbiome is directly related to the foods that you eat. Uh, just to demonstrate that, researchers from the University of Florence compared the makeup of gut microflora in 14 healthy children in rural Burkina Faso, I hope I pronounced that right, BK, with that of 15 healthy children who were living in urban Italy. Well, the children in BK eat a diet that's high in starch and fiber, low in animal protein and fat. The children in Italy eat a diet that's high in animal protein and fat and sugar and low in fiber. In BF, children eat mostly vegetarian diet. They eat a lot of things like millet and sorghum, black-eyed peas and vegetables, almost twice as much fiber as the Italian children. And the diet of the Italian children, unfortunately, because it didn't used to be this way, resembles the diet of American children. Well, the study showed that the differences in the composition of bacteria in children began as soon as breastfeeding stopped. The children in BF had significantly higher levels of beneficial bacteria and lower levels of pathogenic bacteria and more short-chain fatty acids than the Italian children. The researchers hypothesized that the plant-based diet of the children in BF allowed them to, quote, maximize energy from fibers while protecting them from inflammation and non-infectious colonic diseases. The researchers also noted that their findings were consistent with the observations of Dr. Dennis Burkett in the 1960s. We often affectionately refer to Dr. Burkett as the fiber doctor, who reported that Northern Africans eating a near vegetarian diet didn't experience inf uh, non-infectious diseases of the colon, such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. These conditions are prevalent and increasing in incidence in westernized populations. Um, Dr. Burkett also made all kinds of notations and reported that there were differences in uh, many, many diseases, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancer, etc. The authors basically concluded our results suggest that a diet has a, that diet has a dominant role over other possible variables such as ethnicity, sanitation, hygiene, geography, and climate in shaping the gut microbiota. We can hypothesize that the reduction in richness, in richness we observe in the children in Europe, compared with the BF children, could indicate how consumption of sugar, animal fat, and calorie-dense foods in industrialized countries is rapidly limiting the adaptive potential of the microbiota. So it just goes to why it is so important to teach children to eat a health-promoting diet. It's so much easier to teach them from scratch than it is to intervene later on. 
And so um, a kid who gets used to what, what, uh, what's called kid food, and by the way, that's something unusual. It's a, it's a function of westernized societies that there is something called kid food because in most parts of the world, food is food. When you start to be weaned, you just eat food. So kids in our cultures get habituated to eating kid food, which is high in fat and sugar and all the things we don't want kids eating so much of. And this, of course, then results in poor gut ecology, as this study shows, and then that leads to poor health. So uh, we just have to do a better job of caring what happens to our kids and then following through and doing something about it. I think, I think everybody cares. The question is, when are we going to take more action to do something about it? All right, so Gilbert Welch, you hear me speak about him a lot. He's a medical doctor who is in a position of, he has a great deal of respect from his colleagues, and he's written some great books about the limitation of medicine and pointing out that uh, there are a lot of risks associated with diagnostic testing, encouraging patients to become more informed. And he doesn't really talk much about the, some of the types of things we talk about here in terms of choosing to improve your diet and lifestyle habits as a means for addressing disease. But what he is crystal clear on is that the traditional medical model of incessant testing and over-treatment is a bad idea. He just published a new study, and uh, his newest study concerns the efficacy of mammography, which is a topic he's written quite a bit about. And it's another analysis that shows that more women are hurt than helped. So the data that Welch and his colleagues crunched came from the Surveillance, Epidemiology, and End Results Program. It's called SEER, S-E-E-R. And they looked at the incidence of breast cancer and tumor size at the time of diagnosis in women who were 40 years old or older. And then they looked at the fatality rate for breast cancer, both before mammography became a standard screening tool and then after. And the premise of the study was that in order for mammography to work, small malignant tumors should be detected before they have a chance to grow large enough to become palpable and cause symptoms. So what should happen is that if you have more diagnosis of smaller tumors, you'll have less diagnosis of larger tumors over time and then it will influence the death rate. Well, he really didn't cover it in this article, but the reality is that the death rate from breast cancer hasn't really changed much in spite of the fact that we're treating more and more women for it every year. Well, Welch and his colleagues report that the implementation of screening mammography has resulted in a higher percentage of smaller tumors being detected. And these are defined as those that are less than two centimeters and those termed ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS. Um, so there was an increase from 36% to 68%. Now on the other hand, the percentage of larger and invasive tumors, or those that are two centimeters or larger, decreased by half from 64% to 32%. So if you just looked at this data, you would say, well, it seems like mammography is a good idea. Everything is going in the right direction. The problem is, um, with this study, is one that is consistently shown in so many other studies that have looked at the issue. And that is the overdiagnosis of pseudocancer pseudo far exceeds the rate of decline of cancers uh, that are larger and invasive. Um, in this analysis, detection of larger invasive tumors dropped by 30 cases per 100,000 women, while diagnoses of smaller tumors that aren't really cancer increased by 162 per 100,000. Now, assuming that only 30 of the 162 additional small tumors would be expected to progress and turn into something serious, this means that 132 women were overdiagnosed and overtreated since mass is detected and these 132 women would not have progressed to cancer. And so the diagnosis of larger tumors did drop, but you still are stuck with this pesky fact that remains, and it's virtually indisputable that while there are some women who are helped by mammography, the number of women who are hurt by mammography far exceeds that number. And the range is anywhere from um, uh, you know, several hundred to one uh, and, and higher. So it's an imperfect test. And uh, you know, I'm not for mandating people to have it, not have it. My continuing mantra is I just think women should see this before they make a decision about it. And I, I know what the objection is. It's bad for business. But from an ethical standpoint, I just wonder how long it is that some of our colleagues are going to be able to continue to justify the things that they do and the information that they withhold from their patients who should come first, in my world anyway. 
All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.